Do you remember merry on birthdays? Do you remember goodie bags? Did you ever own a brightly colored checkered pattern Aloha shirt or spend hours riding down the towering sky slide? If so, then you're not alone. The most I can remember about the checkers and pogo was just sitting out in the audience and being so excited, raising my hand, going, oh, pick me, please, pick me, pick me. And the donut eating contest. Oh, oh man, I wish they'd pick me, boy. <laughs> yeah, you was on, yeah? I was on, but look, I didn't, I I didn't got the kind of my picture You and your cousins, you know. yeah? Oh, yeah, but check it out. Oh, yeah. <laughs> From 1967 to 1982, one local show reigned among Hawaii's keiki. Thousands of children would rush home from school before 3 o'clock in the afternoon to tune in to KGMB. These are just a few of the props, magazines, toys, and shirts sparked by a kid's show that made its way into many children's homes and hearts. Well, tonight, take a journey back in time to visit the magic that was Checkers and Pogo. <laughs> Checkers and Pogo Remember, a very special presentation of KGMB 9. It was routine. We'd watch Checkers and Pogo every single day after school. I remember I always wanted to go for the pennies in the Marianne birthday jar, you know, because I knew that if I could get my hand inside that Marianne birthday jar, I'd be rich. Good evening, everyone. I'm Russell Shimoka. It's amazing just looking at all this stuff takes me back to when I was a keiki. I was one of those many thrilled children who got a chance to sit in on the Checkers and Pogo show. This wonderful program ran for an incredible 15 years, but few people know that the show was actually thought up on the spur of the moment. The year was 1967. This is the 6 o'clock edition of Channel 9 News and Sports. A time when Bob Seavey anchored the evening news. On Thursday, May 25th, 1967, then KGMB radio program director and zany TV weatherman Jim Weatherize Hawthorne was just returning to the station from an on-the-street radio news broadcast on the Jay Akuhed Pupule show. As he walked down the hall, then station owner and manager C. Seftel called Jim into his office and told him that he was interested in putting together a kid's show in the afternoons. Heftel suggested that Jim host the show with a woman in a bunny costume. And he says, she can put on a bunny suit, and you can be funny with her. So I said, well, let me think about it, and I'll, I'll talk to you tomorrow. So he said, a bunny, did you say? And he says, oh, yeah, she's very good, be great. She has a bunny outfit and everything. I have no idea who she was. I had no idea what I was going to do with a bunny. I wrote a little uh, uh, skit so we could see how it worked. We went ahead and uh, taped it, and uh, both looked at the tape, Cease and I. I said, Cease, I don't think this is going to work. Uh, I, don't, I just can't work with a, with a bunny. Hawthorne's idea was that in order for the show to work, it would have to be done like Laurel and Hardy. His character being the Hardy, he needed to find a Laurel. Station producer Mick Quenzer was a vital part of the show's conception, and suggested that the show resemble one that existed back in Phoenix, Arizona, where he'd work, called the Wallace and Ladmo Show. C. Seftel was convinced and turned to KGMB Radio's number one rated midday DJ, Morgan White. Morgan was already established as Pogo Pogue due to breaking a world record in pogo stick hiking years earlier. So I was on the air at Radio uh, KGMB and uh, C. in a panic ran in, says, Pogue, go into the wardrobe, grab you something, and get on the set because we got to get a kid's show going. So I went in and I grabbed a funny little hat like that and a funny little vest like this and a striped shirt and striped pants. I had whiskers, by the way. They did a test run, and suddenly it seemed to work. Now, this was Friday, and Cease wanted it on the air by Monday. All they needed was a name for the show. For a time, the show was almost called the Weather Eyes and Pogo Show, but Hawthorne thought of something better. Oh, I said, Cease, I've got some glasses here that I just got. They're, they're, they used to call them go-go glasses. So I put the glasses on. These are the very same ones that I had on the original Checkers and Pogo Show. Let's call it Checkers and Pogo. 
and that clicked. On Monday, the first Checkers and Poco show hit the air. Soon after, Hawthorne and White were seen everywhere around town, entertaining thousands of Keiki. Hawthorne told Cease that he thought they still needed something that would identify them as they traveled from place to place. So I said, well, we can do the checkers, and I really should have the, uh, uh, check, uh, the convertible painted uh, checkerboard. And he says, oh, fine, great, do it. And with that said, the checkermobile was born. Keiki across Hawaii could now recognize the twosome wherever they were, whether in parades or just cruising down the street. Thousands of children would now rush home from school to tune in to their two-hour adventures Monday through Friday at 3 in the afternoon. The games and gags in the show became a great escape, from pie-throwing to the unforgettable Marion birthday. One lucky child would be chosen from the audience and get to grab pennies from the penny jar. They could reach in and get as many pennies as, pennies as they could in their hand and, and, and bring it up. And they get to keep all of the pennies they were able to, to bring out. And uh, some of the kids would come up with some pretty weird <laughs> ideas for getting the pennies. They'd turn it over and then they'd bring it out like this and they'd try to get two hands in there and all this. But it was, it was fun watching them. You know? The show was a phenomenal success. But three months later, Jim Hawthorne decided to leave the show. C. Seftel called Checkers and Pogo producer Phil Arnone to tell him the news. He called me and said, guess what, you have no checkers. He's gone. Uh, it's Pogo alone today. I'll look for another checkers for you. So we did the show without a uh, checkers for a, a bit of time. You know, I always wanted one of these. Well, without its lead character, the show couldn't survive for very long. So Cease Heftel feverishly planned an audition to find the next Mr. Checkers. When we come back, we'll meet the man who took over the checkered glass role, Dave Donnelly, and then visit with Jim Demarest, the third and longest running Mr. Checkers. Yeah, I remember Checkers and Pogo, sure. Uh, between the years of 1967 and 1982, I think I was on the show about 68 or 69 times, and I never, uh, never got my funny face on the funny face time. I was never chose for Mary on birthday, and never got my subscription to the Checkers and Pogo magazine. Never got my goodie bag. But you know, I'm not bitter, and uh, I don't think it affected me psychologically at all. It's trivia time. What was Pogo Pogue's favorite food? We'll have the answer for you when we return. in sixth grade at Waianae Elementary School, we had an excursion. We came to this building here at KGMB to see where they make checkers and pogo. And I got to tell you, it had a profound effect on me. That's when I decided this would be my life's work. Serious. This is when I knew what I wanted to do. Because I wanted to be like these people, sitting around in air-conditioned rooms, not doing nothing, eating donuts. And it worked out pretty good. What was Pogo Pogue's favorite food? Popcorn and ice cubes. Wow, do you know what these are? These are an original set of Skyslide tickets. I bet you used yours. Well, the search was on for a new Mr. Checkers, but where were Cease Heftel and producer Phil Arnone going to find him? The answer was simple, hold an audition. After a number of potential candidates had their turn, they found their man in radio disc jockey, Dave Donnelly. I got a call from a friend of mine who worked at the station at Cape Boy saying, you've done theater for youth. How'd you like to do theater for youth and get paid for it? And I said, well, that sounds interesting. So I came over here and uh, they did a couple of audition shows. They had different people come in and audition for the role. He liked me, so he uh, hired me away from Cape Boy. Donnelly, having an extensive background in theater production, easily slid into the role. It was a piece of cake for me because I'd worked doing theater for youth that really helped because I was used to, to dealing with kids and performing for kids is great fun and it takes a certain technique and I think I fit in fairly naturally. As Jim Hawthorne before him, Dave Donnelly as Mr. Checkers traveled everywhere with Pogue, making personal appearances and making children happy. By this time, the show began to feature Checkers and Pogo in grand adventures. We got pretty inventive and we had we had things going on in 1967 that were so far ahead of their time, and we had us walking around on pumpkins in outer space. You know, now they're doing all this digitalized stuff. We were doing it 30 years ago 
without the digitalization process. After about a year, Dave Donnelly decided to accept a job at the Honolulu Star Bulletin as a columnist. Once again, Heftel and Arnone were without a checkers. Heftel had heard about an actor who was performing in town. His name, Jim Demarest. I was doing musicals for Herb Rogers at the HIC, and uh, I didn't know it, but they were looking for another checkers. Heftel signed Demarest to a contract, and on August 28, 1968, he hit the air as the third and final Mr. Checkers. After about a week and a half of this, all of a sudden, I could walk out into the parking lot of KGMB, or I could be any place because I wore their, the checkered glasses at the time. And holy smokes, where in the heck of a, what's happening? You realize that these people have been watching you. Demarest became an instant success. Together, he and Morgan White became the most popular icon in Hawaii television. Mr. Checkers was the eternal parent. No matter what, he was the parent, and, and Pogue was the eternal youth. They kept asking me, how old are you, Pogo? And I'd have to say, well, I'm probably 16. <gasps> are you that old? <laughs> <laughs> we didn't have to actually tell each other what was going to happen. We basically knew from just doing it before and many times over. And believe me, if there was anything that we did many times over, it was the same old gag under a different disguise, but it was the same old gag. Something's really going to happen around Oh, here. I do too. I got that strange feeling. Yeah, yeah. Something real. Just, just, something is just going to take over and... and... What's the matter, Miss Juggers? Checkers and Pogo were everywhere, at kitty carnivals, in parades, and were even bestowed the Gifts of Ali'i Award by the Hawaii 4-H Club, given to persons who symbolize the highest type of leadership in Hawaii. Now, no matter where they went, Jim and Morgan would always be recognized and idolized as Checkers and Pogo. Uh, I remember one time when we were sitting in, a, uh, my wife and I had gone to Maui, and we were sitting there in a restaurant one evening, uh, just enjoying a, a quiet dinner and all of a sudden my wife touched my arm and it went like this and I looked down and there was two little kids sitting standing there looking up at me um, I couldn't have been over two or three years old either one of them and finally I, I turned around kind of quick and, and they kind of jumped back and the one little boy's his, his chin started to quiver and I said hi what can I do for you and he looked at me and said, we love you, Pogo. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and I, of course, that was the type of thing that I wanted to project to the children of Hawaii. And I just kind of scooped them up and gave them a big squeeze. And one day, we, were, we, we had a big circle that we followed. And he, he went one way and I went another way. And there was a woman who had romper room for a couple of years, but she now had, was off it. And I saw her. And she had this little child, a little fellow, who could not even hold his head up, but he was more than conscious with his eyes, see. And I said, hello, how are you? And he started to blab. And I answered as if, as if I, I understood what he was saying. And all of a sudden she said, Jim, don't stop. This is the first time he's talked in two years. And, and then Morgan Pogo, showed up and I introduced Pogue to him and he did the same thing and when we left to go back to KGMB we were both crying we were both weeping like you wouldn't believe it. little things happen but it's the people that make the difference up next we'll have a chat with Jerry Cox better known as super spy Sylvester and many other supporting characters on the show and we'll meet Fred Ball known to everyone as good old professor fun I thought Super Spy was the coolest, and I remember his theme song. It went, Super Spy, Super Spy, oh, what a spy, what a spy am I. Da-da-da, 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 da-da-da. 
Where was Super Spy's hometown? We'll have the answer for you when we come back. I remember Checkers and Pogos running home right after elementary school, watching Professor Fun come out every week, taking a deck of cards, showing a card, and making it change right before your very eyes. Where was Super Spy's hometown? Pigstyvania. Gee, this thing looks so much bigger on TV. Well, this is the original working effects model of the airship called the Albatross. For a time in the mid-70s, Checkers and Pogo would travel to many places aboard this thing. There was much more to the Checkers and Pogo show than just Checkers and Pogo. Over the years, there were dozens of supporting characters that appeared on the show. Characters like the Banana Splits, Doc Fruitcake, the scientists, and Mr. Mac from the Hawaiian Humane Society. But perhaps the best known was Super Spy. Jerry Cox, the man of many faces. Jerry joined KGMB Radio back in 1966 and took on the persona of Kim Chi. In the early stages of Checkers and Pogo, Phil Arnone asked Jerry to be a writer on the show. It wasn't long before Jerry began playing some of the characters he wrote about. Super Spy, back in the early part of the show, back in 67, Super Spy evolved from a character we needed, sort of like uh, a foil for Checkers and Pogo. It was Scudge McPig, but somehow he acquired a Russian accent and the Fu Manchu mustache, the sunglasses, and the Cossack hat and the Cossack shirt and the riding boots. He was always trying to take over the world. He, well, he, well, he, he wanted to be number one kitty star. And of course, if Super Spy succeeded in taking over the Checkers and Pogo show, he'd need his own theme songs. Super Spy, Super Spy, oh, what a spy, what a spy am I. Remember that song? That was from Jesus Christ Superstar. And the other one was Springtime for the Super Spy and Pig Stivania. And then there was Sylvester Heftel, the whining, bratty, spoiled kid who was portrayed as the nephew of station owner C. Heftel. The thing with Sylvester is wore those pla I wore those plastic glasses. They didn't have any lenses in them. Wore them for years. And the wig, the wig used it for so many years that it just, I couldn't tell which was front and which was back. He was the nephew of C. Sylvester always hung him over Checkers and poor Pogo as a sort of Damocles. If he didn't get his way, then he was going to go and tell his uncle to fire them, and he'd take over the show. Sylvester uh, <laughs> Heftel, who was supposedly Mr. Heftel's spoiled little nephew, came on the set, and he wanted to get rid of Pogo. And so he fired Pogo. And Pogo, in complete dejection, with complete uh, despair, sidled off the set and the camera followed him off. And I guess the switchboards lit up and the kids came down with signs, we want Pogo, we want Pogo. And, and it was very touching to me because uh, um, the fact that the kids felt that this, this was for real to them, you know, and Pogo had been fired and, uh, and they probably would not see him again. Jerry Cox completely loved playing character roles for the kids, though not all of his experiences were painless. And I remember the kids. The kids were so funny, and I loved, I loved to just tease kids. One scene call for me to chase Checkers and Pogo out in the audience with the kids. Well, that was a mistake. That was our first mistake. I never did that again. Two kids caught me, and one kid just 
pummeled me in the bollocks, man. It took me about 20 minutes to get my breath back. Take that, super spy, you bad guy. We got him, checkers in Pogo. He's not going to bother you. Another well-known character that appeared on the program still practices his craft. Fred Ball, known in Hawaii as Professor Fun, got his start on the mainland doing country western shows with Minnie Pearl and Jimmy Dickens. Eventually, he worked his way onto the Bozo the Clown show in Boston. When he arrived in Hawaii, though, it was strictly for education. I came to Hawaii to study general semantics at the University of Hawaii from Dr. S.I. Hayakawa, who was the visiting uh, professor in uh, the summer session. I talked to people like Eddie Sherman and Bob Krause, and they said, well, you're not going to be able to make a living entertaining here. So I said, OK, I won't entertain. I will just pursue my educational career and go into teaching. And But then one thing led to another. I had done shows with uh, Sheriff Ken, who had previously been on television here at uh, Channel 9. Fred was asked to come down to KGMB to audition for the Checkers and Pogo show. One performance was all they needed. They hired me the very first week I came down. I was on the Checkers and Pogo show. I think I did, uh, I believe I did ventriloquism and maybe a, a one magic trick or something. And that was like my audition. Afterwards, Phil uh, came out of the booth, said, well, well uh, you know, we want to have you on our show. One of the features was called Funny Faces, a segment where the camera would turn on a row of kids and watch as they made all kinds of facial expressions. Fred Ball remembers it well. When we first went on the air, they did Funny Faces, and the switchboard lit up. Complaints from parents, school teachers, why are you encouraging children to make faces? We're trying to teach them to behave in school and to not mess around and blah, 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 blah. And they were irate people. And I wondered, well, it looks like that's the end of funny faces. But we kept doing funny faces on, I think, every show. And eventually, the people got, got used to it. And it became people's favorite. One of their favorite things was the funny faces. Professor Fun was, was one of the people that came